All right, good morning, church, and we are glad that you have joined us for this online Bible study. A uh, tremendous opportunity, while some of us have a little bit of extra time on our hands, uh, to dive into God's Word. Uh, if you're not watching this live, uh, it will be available. The content will be archived uh, later on so that you can pick it up afterwards. But I would encourage you, as you're able on Tuesdays and Thursdays, to join us live at 9 uh, so that you can actively uh, participate if you have questions or comments, uh, please feel free to uh, utilize the comment section on either Facebook or YouTube, whichever platform you're watching. I'll try to keep an eye on the comments, uh, but if we miss something or if you have a question and I don't address it in the video, I promise uh, it will be addressed in the next study. So we are going to look at uh, the book of Habakkuk. And as I mentioned in the advertisement, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, in the south, we say Habakkuk. Uh, I think the farther south you go, the less of a K there is on the end of it. Uh, so you might hear me say Habakkuk, Habakkuk, or Habakkuk. Uh, those are all acceptable. And if you speak ancient Hebrew, uh, please give me a call and maybe you can give me some clarity on that. Before we get started, just a couple of reminders. Uh, we are obviously in a very unique time in history, uh, in a very unique time in our country. Uh, don't forget, don't forget to look after people. Don't forget to uh, check in on folks and uh, don't forget to find ways uh, to be kind out there because uh, as we've said over and over uh, for the last several weeks, the Christian response to uncertainty should always be different uh, than the response of the world. If you'd like to specifically have opportunities to perhaps check on folks, uh, Pastor Ed is ramping up our care ministry and uh, we're looking for folks that uh, both need help, uh, need assistance, might need somebody to run an errand for them, or people that have the time to do that. Uh, so if you could contact Pastor Ed directly, his email address is on our church's website. It's eblizzard at lakeshorebaptist.org. Uh, he will coordinate with you whether you are someone who can provide assistance or someone who perhaps needs some assistance. You just either can't get out or shouldn't get out uh, during the situation that we're going through. So uh, please let us know how we can help you. The only thing the church is limited in right now is its ability to congregate together. But everything else that the church does, everything else that the church is about is uh, still full forward. And uh, hopefully you can find ways to be a part of that. So confession time. I've never studied the book of Habakkuk. I've certainly read it as we go through, like, a read the Bible in a year or a daily reading plan. I've read the book of Habakkuk, but I've never studied it. And if you're honest with yourself, you might not have studied it either. It's kind of lost in the middle of the minor prophets, and we kind of skim over it. But it is a book, and I think we'll see as we go through this, it is a book that is so appropriate for the time in which we live. Uh, we don't know much about Habakkuk. Uh, we, his name is only mentioned a couple times in his own prophecy here and nowhere else in Scripture. Uh, you'll see uh, your Bible probably has uh, the book written somewhat in a, a prose or poem format. So we uh, assume from that that he was perhaps a, a priest that would have been involved in worship because that's how they wrote, similar to how the Psalms were written. Um, but we don't know much about him. We do know a little bit about the time period in which he wrote the book. This was going to be during the reign of King Jehoiakim. Now, if you recall a couple weeks ago, or actually it's been a couple months ago, uh, we talked about this time period in history. Uh, the last few kings of the southern kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, we had Jeho Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and then Zedekiah, who ended up being the last king uh, of Judah. So this was prophesied during the reign of Jehoiakim. This was a, a, a tedious time in the history of God's people because they were, they were being evil and they were being wicked and they were suffering uh, judgment and consequences uh, because of that. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of God's judgment and, and God dealing with the world, uh, but I want to preface that with something because you do hear uh, pastors uh, kind of leveraging this idea in, a, in an unhealthy way. Uh, there's an idea in the world that in anything we experience, uh, any natural disaster, any calamity of any sort, is uh, God's way of, of getting us. You, you'll hear, hear people insensitively say things like, 
God was mad at New Orleans. That's why Hurricane Katrina hit. Uh, God was mad at New York. That's why we had 9-11 and, and things like that. And, and that can paint God in a really scary light. This idea that God is just in the sky with his thumb on the smite button, uh, waiting for us to mess up uh, uh, so that he can ultimately judge and destroy us. The picture I get of God at all in scripture. Uh, I do get a picture, however, of God, of a God who gives us over uh, to our own consequences. And that was certainly the case uh, all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, God was allowing the people uh, to choose what they wanted. Uh, he was allowing them to choose the, the gods that they wanted to worship, uh, the people that they wanted to intermingle with. And ultimately, those choices came with consequences. Many of those consequences led to their destruction. Uh, in our own culture, uh, God allows us to experience the consequences of our own choices. And if we are giving ourselves over to certain things, all of that comes with consequences. So it's a little bit of a, a different shift of, of what maybe on the surface it looks like God's just waiting for us to mess up and, and cast judgment. But it's more of God allowing us to experience uh, consequence. And we're going to see that a little bit in this book. So it's a tedious time in the kingdom of southern Judah. Uh, it's about 605 uh, BC. The northern kingdom, uh, after the kingdom split, the northern kingdom has already fallen to the Assyrians. Uh, it would be about another 30 years, and the southern kingdom would finally fall to the Babylonians. And this is when Habakkuk is giving his prophecy. Now, if you read prophecy in the Old Testament, uh, normally it is a prophet saying what God is going to do to people. Uh, who, you know, they say things like, thus saith the Lord, this is what's going to happen. And they prophesy what God is going to do. Uh, the book of Habakkuk works a little bit differently in that he is asking God, what are you going to do? In fact, he's asking them, asking him, God, not only what are you going to do, but why are you going to do it? Uh, what is going on in the world and what do you have to do with it? So it's a it's an interesting conversation that this prophet has with God. We're going to try to get through the first uh, first chapter today, uh, just kind of section by section and verse by verse. And um, so hopefully you have a Bible, and I'm just going to read the first uh, four verses. This is the beginning of Habakkuk's prophecy, and hopefully you also have some coffee. Habakkuk chapter 1 says, The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Now these are some pretty pretty lofty claims from this prophet. And honestly, it was written in 600 BC, but it's something that could be written in 2020 AD. This idea that God, there's violence going on and you're doing nothing about it. God, there's iniquity going on and you don't seem to be doing anything about it. All I see are destruction and violence, strife and contention. So it seems like, God, if I'm just reading this on a cursory level, it seems like the law is paralyzed. The, the, the law means nothing and justice is perverted because of everything. And he has a little bit of a, of a dig here because of everything you're allowing to go on in the world. So this is a pretty um, scathing commentary from Habakkuk to God that we see all these things going on. Violence, iniquity, destruction, violence, perverted justice. And he's calling out God and saying, why? Why is this going on? Why are you allowing it to go on? Now, if you were reading this or if you were writing this, what do you see going on in the world that you would call out to God about? Now, obviously we are in the middle of a global pandemic. Not only are people uh, suffering illnesses, uh, that some will not recover from and some will, but uh, the indirect results of that, the, the economic downfall and the uncertainty and people losing their jobs and, and uh, the emotional uh, 
consequences that people suffer just kind of being kind of being distanced from friends and family and things like that we're in that situation right now but i kind of want to uh, broaden our view a little bit uh, let's not make this all about uh, february and march 2020 but if you were to, to call out to god uh, the last thing that you saw the last thing that you saw that confused you or at the very least made you question god what in the world are you doing what would that be i want to give you just a second to kind of jot those answers down some of these you'll jot down to yourself if you want to comment in the comment section uh that would be fine but just think of the first four verses of habakkuk if you were writing them what would you call out to god about we'll be right back with you. all right I think we're almost back up to how many people we had. My apologies. I'm not going to pause the video again because apparently I don't know how to do that. So the question is what we see in the world that would mirror uh, the first four verses of Habakkuk. Do we look and we see uh, unbridled violence? Absolutely. Uh, do we see injustice? Uh, do we see this idea of what he calls justice being perverted, where it seems like the law doesn't even matter? And I would say those things are certainly uh, prevalent in our world. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, the approach of Habakkuk in these first four verses because it tells us a lot about his relationship with God. Uh, first and foremost, Habakkuk had a sensitivity uh, to sin. You know, these things bothered him. And I think that's something that certainly in 21st century culture uh, we kind of lose sometimes. Uh, this idea that all of these things that, that we mentioned and all these things that he mentioned are certainly going on around us, uh, but we don't take the time to stop and say, hey, that's not right. And this prophet was bothered by, he was burdened by the idea of such unbridled sin going on around him. And as Christians, certainly in the world that we live in, uh, friends, we should be bothered. We should be bothered by sin. We should be bothered by injustice and if there's something going on that isn't right uh, christians should be the first ones to stand up and say that's not right so habakkuk had a sensitivity to sin uh, he also had and this maybe this is not the kind of god you grew up with but it's the kind of god that i see in scripture um, he had uh, permission uh, it was normal for habakkuk to be confused do you know you don't always have to understand what God is doing? Uh, you don't always have to say, well, you know, whatever God wants, God wants, and that's fine with me. Now, we certainly uh, submit ourselves to God's will, and we hopefully align ourselves with God's will. But this prophet was very comfortable saying, God, I don't get it. God, it doesn't make sense to me. And I believe that it's okay for us to say that as well. You know what, God? I, I'm submitting myself to you, but I don't understand it. And that's exactly what he was saying here, is that I don't understand why all these things are happening. So he had a sensitivity towards sin. Uh, he had a willingness to, to, to be confused and to voice his confusion to God. And finally, he had a, a relationship with God in which he could do so. I think one of the things that we perhaps take for granted uh, so much in, in our Christian faith is the fact that we have the privilege of calling God Father. We have the privilege of having a conversation with the creator of the universe. And he was certainly taking advantage of that. And sometimes that's not something that we take advantage of. We pray uh, very church prayers, prayers that we were taught to pray or prayers that we think we're supposed to pray. And you know, sometimes it's okay to talk to God as a perfect heavenly father, someone who confuses you, someone who you don't always understand, uh, but someone that you have a deep, intimate uh, relationship with. And that's what he was willing to do. So Habakkuk sees everything going on in the world and he just doesn't understand it. And that's why we're studying this right now in March of 2020, because I think all of us in the last week or the last couple of weeks have looked around the, the world and said, God, I don't understand what you're doing. Next few verses, uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. This is God's response. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that if I told you, 
you would not believe if I told. Let me read that again. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told. That's better. Just this first verse, uh, I think, could probably be God's response to our concerns most of the time. Look among the nations, wonder and be astounded. I'm doing something that if I told you, you wouldn't even believe that I was doing it. He says, for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. The Chaldeans is another name for the Babylonians. And the Babylonian empire uh, was one of the greatest, if not the greatest in this time period. Uh, they had a familiarity with, with the people and they were a warlike, uh, angry nation. And God will go on to describe them as such in the next few verses. It says, uh, they are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than lepers, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on, come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence and their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings, they scoff. At rulers, they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose might is their God. So God describes the Chaldeans or the Babylonians in some pretty pretty glaring terms. Their, their violence and how mighty and how powerful they are. And the, the scary thing about that, certainly for Habakkuk, is that God says he is raising up the Chaldeans, that he is actually going to work through the Chaldeans, work through the Babylonians, even though they are an evil, warlike nation. Now, this is confusing, how a holy God can work through evil people. But you've seen that before, and we'll continue to see that. Here's one of the greatest things, uh, one of the greatest attributes of God that I think is really important to focus on, especially uh, in times such as we live. God has never been surprised about anything that's ever happened. Now, I know that we know that uh, because God is sovereign and omnipotent and omniscient and all those things. But have you ever really thought about it in those terms that God has never been surprised about anything that's ever happened in the world? Nothing has ever caught him off guard. Now, that certainly changes how we view the things that happen in the world, because that means the good things have all been filtered through his sovereignty and his grace. But that also means the bad things, whether they were consequences of, of your actions or consequences of someone else's actions have never surprised God. What we also know about God is that all of these things, good, bad, and indifferent, can and will be used for his glory. Now, that doesn't always seem fair when it's something bad, when it's something that hurts, but it doesn't have to be fair in order to be true. God tells Habakkuk, look among the nations and see. He basically says, sit there, be quiet, and be astonished. Check out what I'm doing in the world. If, if, if I would describe it to you, if I would explain it to you, you would not understand. This is Habakkuk's response. Verse 12, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Understand what he's talking about here. Judah had certainly rebelled against God. But the Babylonians were far worse than Judah. And so he points out in this verse that the wicked, the Babylonians, are swallowing up the man more righteous, Judah, than he. That is to say, God, we've messed up, but certainly you won't use somebody worse than us to punish us. He goes on and says, you make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. 
Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. He, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? So he kind of goes through this back and forth conversation with God where he's acknowledging God's uh, power and God's might and, and even God's righteousness. But at the same time, so questioning, like, what are you doing? How are you going to let this happen? If you're a holy God, how are you going to let evil people overcome us? But finally, this section ends at the beginning of chapter two. He says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. So we're just getting started with this conversation that Habakkuk is having with God. And we're kind of in the middle where Habakkuk says, all right, I'm going to stay put. I'm going to watch. I'm going to listen. And I'm going to see how God answers these questions and these complaints that I have. Like I said before, this is a, an appropriate study for the time that we live in. Because many of us have looked around and said, God, what are you doing? And, and how can you let these kinds of things happen? I mean, you know, we understand that, that there are consequences to action. We understand that, that evil people suffer. And we understand that righteous people suffer. But it would be easy to say, God, there's something going on in the world where now churches can't even meet together physically. Certainly, you can't be behind that. But God says, look, wait, be astonished. If I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't even understand it. And so our response has to be the response of Habakkuk, where we say, you know what? I'm going to wait. I'm going to listen. I'm going to look and I'm going to trust because of all of those attributes that Habakkuk listed about God. So that's where we are. That's where we are this week. And that's where we'll probably be for several weeks, waiting, looking and trusting. So my question for you that I want to leave you with, and we'll be back on this on Thursday morning. The question is, uh, how can you trust God this week? Now, now, we always kind of speak that in a broad sense, like, I'll trust God, you know, that I'll be okay. I'll trust God that everything will work out, or, or even broader, I'll trust that, you know, God's will will be done. Let me take some uh, load off your shoulders. God's will uh, will be done. You don't even have to trust that that will happen. It will happen whether you trust in it or not. But specifically, not in a broad church answer sense of how we can trust God this week, but specifically, how can you trust God this week? Maybe you need to trust God with your finances because this uh, uncertainty has, has affected you financially. Uh, maybe you need to trust God with, with your, your physical health because you might be one of those people that, that is deemed higher risk that you, you don't even want to leave your house and you probably shouldn't. Maybe you need to trust God with your opportunities. Do you know how many tremendous opportunities uh, the church is being given during this time where we can't even physically meet in our building, but the church is still moving forward in a mighty way. In fact, the church has always moved forward in a mighty way in times when it had the most restrictions uh, put on it all throughout history. So how will you trust God this week? What can you put in his hands that maybe you've been holding on to the last week or two in this time of tremendous anxiety and uncertainty? I think if we would say, God, what's up with this pandemic? What's going on in the world? Why are you doing this to them? Why are you doing this to us? He would say, look, listen, observe. If I gave you all the details and if I explained it to you, I don't even think you would understand. But trust who I am. Because I've shown you over and over, and Habakkuk certainly had evidence all throughout Scripture, and we certainly have even more evidence. I've showed you all throughout creation of what I'm about. So put your faith and trust in me and I will do something amazing through you because of who I am. I look forward to jumping into chapter two when we're together next week, or excuse me, when we're together on Thursday. Please, uh, please keep in touch with your church. Uh, if you have prayer requests, you can submit them at lakeshorebaptist.org. 
Uh, you can give on lakeshorebaptist.org. You can contact your pastors and staff on lakeshorebaptist.org. Uh, let's stay in touch. Uh, let's stay together. Let's continue to jump in the word together. And uh, we will get through this. And the church will be better for it. And I believe you can be better for it. I'll see you on Thursday at 9 o'clock. And we are going to have another virtual worship service this Sunday on the 29th at 10 a.m. Uh, this is a tremendous opportunity. and We already saw it happening on Sunday. Uh, you know, there are people that you can't get to come to church with you that are sitting in their house stir crazy. And if you send them a link on Sunday morning, they might just click on it. So this is a tremendous opportunity to maybe evangelize and share uh, in a different way, in a unique way. So find those opportunities, find ways that you can trust God this week. And I will see you guys on Thursday. Have a great day.